some of the things that Satan uses to uh, hurt us. Uh, last, last week we looked at Satan the deceiver. And uh, particularly how he, he targets our, our mind. And he wants to confuse us. He wants to um, deceive us. In uh, 2 Corinthians 4, it said that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine un unto them. And he, you know, he, he wants to keep people from, uh, from following God's word. Tonight we're looking at Satan as the destroyer. We're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 5. And as I studied this out and thought about it, there, there's more targets than just, or, or his target is our body, but there's more weapons than just suffering. We're, we're mainly looking at suffering tonight. Um, and you see this, you see this all around us. People who think that they're living for fun end up suffering quite often. Uh, you see the, the tattoos and the cuttings and the raging that, that goes on in, in people's lives, and, and it ends up being so corrupt and hurtful to people, drugs and, and so on. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 6. I'm just going to read verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So he gives us a real plain and, and simple warning here uh, that Satan is our adversary. Uh, Satan is a destroyer. He's like a lion. He just wants to tear us to shreds. Um, Jesus said to, to Peter in uh, Luke 22, Simon, uh, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. I don't know what picture you get from there, but I don't get a good one. <laughs> You know, that's, uh, he, he's saying he wants to destroy you. He wants to eat you and make you like food. Um, the reference there in Matthew talks about there was brought unto him, that's to Jesus, one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. You know, that's the way Satan works. That's what he wants to do. Uh, Satan's target is our body. Now, it's not just Christians. It's anybody. Satan hates everybody. Uh, but for Christians particularly, the Bible, uh, there's some reasons why he's doing this. We sang 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 because our body is God's temple. You know how you see people going around and defacing property? That's what Satan wants to do to us and, and to, to people. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Um, Philippians, he says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, it's supposed to be so, now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. God wants to use our body, so, of course, Satan wants to mess it up so it can't be used properly. It'd be kind of like a flood washing through and making everything uh, all miserable is what he wants. Uh, so it's, Satan's target is our body because, number one, your body is God's temple. Secondly, because your body is God's tool. We're using that in a, in a good sense. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, Sunday night we, uh, we've been looking at 2 Corinthians and one of the statements he makes in 2 Corinthians 4 is we have this ministry. God wants to use us. God wants to uh, use us to accomplish his glory. Uh, Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, we, we sang Romans chapter 6, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Um, you know, God wants to use our body. Satan wants to, to ruin it because God can, uh, can get blessing out of us. The verse went on, don't or neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Uh, 
So anything God wants to do, Satan's going to oppose. Thirdly, um, Satan targets our body because your body contains God's treasure. <laughs> you know, we, we talked about that again in, in 2 Corinthians. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In Timothy, he says, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. We, we have the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Satan wants to mess up uh, that, that situation. There's a lot of, uh, of verses that, uh, that talk about this kind of thing. In, in, in 1 Timothy, he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. God has given us so much. Uh, we contain a treasure. The, the last one is your body is God's testing ground. Now by that, what we're talking about has been illustrated pretty well in the news the last couple of days. There's some cricket players whose lives have completely changed because they broke the rules. Have you guys been aware of that? It's just been so sad. And, you know, that's what Satan wants to do to us. He wants us to break the rules so that we can't be used of the Lord. He wants, you, he wants to rob you of rewards. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, I bring under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And you know, I've met Christians who used to serve the Lord, but you know they did some shameful thing and uh, no longer are, are able to. And, 1 John 2.28, he talks about that we, won't, we don't want to be ashamed before him at his coming. Uh, your body is God's testing ground, in, in a sense. Uh, keep in mind Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Satan targets our body because God can use it for his, his glory. God intends your body for good things. So we need to be careful uh, not to corrupt it. So his target is our body. His weapon is often suffering. If you think about it, there's other things. Uh, pl the pleasure of sin is, is something that he uses to afflict our body. Uh, but uh, with the subject of suffering, it's particularly illustrated in the man Job. Remember Job? When you first became a Christian, you thought his name was Job, didn't you? Uh, but that's okay. Maybe it is. <laughs> uh, Job, a uh, godly man. And uh, yet when you think about it, all the things he lost, you can compare, you can relate to his body. He lost uh, his children, the fruit of his body. Uh, he lost his wealth, the, the sustenance and the product of his body. He lost his health, you know, afflicted his body. Satan attacked his body. Now, at first he didn't, but then he... He said to, to God, well, he, he's only doing right because you haven't let me hit him. All right, have a go. And, uh, you know, Job really, really suffered, and a lot of it was, was, was physical. In life, there's, there's lots of different kinds of suffering, and Satan doesn't care. He'll use anything. Um, some suffering is just what you might call natural. I think I put that word there. Just because we're human and live in a, in a fallen world. Um, Romans chapter 8 talks about how the world groans under the, the curse of sin. Some suffering is going to be God's chastening. Now, the problem with suffering is sometimes we think we know what's causing it, and we can be wrong. <laughs> sometimes we think, oh, it's God's chastening me, and, and it, it might not be. With, uh, with Job, it wasn't the Lord doing it, but the Lord had given Satan permission to do it. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6 he says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And because God loves us, sometimes he disciplines us. But sometimes we'll suffer for righteousness' sake. Yeah, there's people who just because they love the Lord and follow the Lord, uh, you know, you can lose your job, you can lose your life uh, for following the Lord. One person pointed out there's different kinds of storms. You know, when Jonah went through a storm, what was the cause of his storm? Um, he got well, the cause, though, was disobedience. When Jonah went through the storm, it's because he was going the wrong way. 
But when the disciples went through a storm, the cause was obedience. You know, Jesus said, let's get in the boat. We're going to the other side. They just did what he said, and boy, it brought them into a storm. <laughs> See, you can't always tell by the circumstance as to why the suffering is there. But Satan, no matter why the suffering is there, he'll want you to turn against God. <laughs> you know, anytime somebody dies or something bad happens, you know, there's always people who say, oh, nice God, you know, let this happen. And they don't go back to who caused it, and it was Adam, and it's Satan, and, and, and so on. Now, Job was permitted to suffer to silence Satan, really. And, and when you think about Job and his suffering, a couple of the things that really stand out, one is God is in control and, and has a good purpose. But secondly, the main battle was not what they were seeing. The main battle was going on in heaven. Uh, that, that's what he talks about in Ephesians 6 when he says, um, let me get it here, Ephesians 6, 12. He says that, uh, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The main battle is in the, the realm of the spirit. And we need to make sure that our body is under God's control. Suffering can come from nature, from God, from Satan. Uh, we can't control the origin. And we won't always even know. But we can control our response, and through that, the outcome. We can see God do something good, no matter what our situation. Uh, Satan's target is our body. His weapon is suffering. And his, his purpose is to make you impatient with God's will. In uh, James chapter 5, and verse 11, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So we can see the end of that story and see that God had a good purpose. God did, did some, some wonderful things through that. In James 1, verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. See, Satan wants us impatient. Oh, this is no good. I, you know, it, we, people will say things like, I just can't take this anymore. I've come to the end. <laughs> well, God says, you haven't, if you know the Lord. Uh, impatience, I give you, I guess they're written down there, impatience is a mark of immaturity. You, you remember when we were kids, are we there yet? <laughs> I, I can't wait. You know, I just can't wait. I won't wait. And as we get older and we're still impatient, uh, we get in trouble when we don't wait for the right time. Uh, impatience is a mark of unbelief. Isaiah said, he that believeth shall not make haste. <laughs> we don't have to be in a hurry when we're living by faith. Hebrews 6, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. God's not in a hurry. God's got all the time in the world. And when we get impatient, that's falling into Satan's trap. Oh, I want it. And I, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> impatience is also a mark of fleshly living. If you really think about it, it's the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I know patience is uh, not listed as a, one of the fruit of the Spirit, but there's pretty close to it, long-suffering, temperance. Uh, if we're going to be impatient, uh, we're not going to be living by the fruit of the Spirit. Think about some of the examples in the Bible of people who got ahead of God. Remember Abraham and Sarah? God had told them they'd have a child. Oh, they weren't having a child. Abraham, you take the maid. What was her name? Hagar. Hagar. Boy, that was a great idea, wasn't it? So the world is still suffering for it today. Um, you know, instead of waiting for God's time, and they did have that child that God had promised, but it was in God's time. Uh, you remember King Saul when he was ready for battle and they had to do, they wanted to do the, the religious things first and he got in a hurry, he wouldn't wait for Samuel. And, uh, you know, Samuel asked him some questions, he actually lies about it and, and so on. And because of his impatience, that's when God said, your time's up. No more of you to be king. Probably another example is when Jesus was being arrested in the garden and Peter pulls his sword. 
and he's going to defend the Lord Jesus, cut the guy's ear off, and so on. Uh, impatience. Uh, God always has a time. God always has a purpose. And, uh, you know, because he doesn't check in with us, uh, sometimes we think, oh, he's forgotten, or he doesn't know, doesn't understand the situation, uh, but he does. In Job 23.10, it says, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And there's there's got to be patience there. Satan's purpose is to bring out the worst in us. And your defense is the imparted grace of God. <laughs> First Peter 5.10 calls him the God of all grace. Uh, you know, we read how Jesus warned Peter that Satan wanted to grind him like wheat. The, the very next verse, Jesus says this to him. But I've prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. <laughs> People debate over what, what, that, what that means, but you, you can see this. Jesus will help us. You know, Satan wants to hurt us. Jesus wants to help us. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at uh, Paul's situation. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had a, a physical difficulty in the flesh, in, in his body. It's interesting, the Bible calls it the messenger of Satan. 2 Corinthians, what did I say? 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I thought I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, here's what God said to him, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul's response, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, our defense is the imparted grace of God. In Paul's situation, it wasn't that his situation was changed. It was just the grace of God in his situation. And a very important statement there, my grace is sufficient for thee. And you know, as, as we look at the difficulties we face physically, uh, there's some steps that we can take. Uh, you know, when we're going through uh, uh, temptations, when we're going through suffering, uh, number one, immediately submit yourself to God. I mean, that, that's the first thing we need to look at. Don't rebel. You know, too often we do the wrong thing and then we repent, you know. Instead of doing that, let's, let's just do the right thing. Uh, Job was able to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And that needs to be the attitude we have. We just don't know. We don't know what's going on in heaven. Uh, submit ourselves to God. Secondly, thank God for the trial. This is a hard thing to do. I've, I've had a few times where you, you feel almost silly. <laughs> Lord, you know, thank you for this whatever, you know physical ailment that I've got. Ephesians 5.20, he says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God. Probably more well known, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then thirdly, go to God's word. You begin to search the scriptures and see uh, what God might, might show to you. In Acts 20, he calls it the word of his grace. And that's where we're going to find out about God's grace. Uh, you'll find promises. Uh, you'll find encouragement. And then fourthly, look for ways to glorify God. Whatever situation you're in, uh, look for ways that God can get the glory. Uh, we have a friend who's been suffering with uh, some pretty severe cancer and uh, going for treatments and so on and it's interesting to hear his, his comments. Oh, I got a, I've had a lot of opportunities to witness to doctors and nurses, he said. <laughs> you know, I mean, he could complain and moan and groan, but he's, he's seeing, well, here's an opportunity I wouldn't have if I wasn't sick. And, you know, it's not the kind of opportunity you ask God for, <laughs> necessarily. Uh, although there were people many years ago who would actually let themselves be sold into slavery so they could reach people uh, that they wouldn't have been able to reach in any other way. That's, that's amazing. Uh, but look for ways to glorify God. First Peter 2 and, and verse 20, 
He says, what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Yeah, when, when we do wrong and suffer, well, we expect that. But when you're doing right and you suffer, well, look, look for what God's doing. Uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 16. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Uh, as times are changing, it, it may be that we'll suffer for just normal Christian activity. And we need to be willing to do that and see what God will do. God may not change the circumstances, but he will change you. Now, sometimes he does change the circumstances. We, we like those. <laughs> you know, we like those testimonies when, boom, you know, God changes the situation. But he just doesn't always do that. Now, many of the disciples were taken and killed. You know, God didn't rescue them. He just took them home. Uh, but he will change us. That uh, verse in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9 is a verse that we need to hang on to with this. His, his grace is sufficient. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And put it this way. If you live to please self, Satan wins. But if we live to glorify God, Satan will lose. And, uh, you know, it's not just suffering that Satan uses to attack our, our bodies, uh, but it's, it is a big one. Grace is what defeats Satan, and it's found only in the God of all grace. And what a blessing it is that we have the God of all grace. Let me just close by reading again 1 Peter 5.10. The God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And that's a blessing. Any comments or questions before we take prayer requests tonight? Like I said, I'm particularly trying to give you prolific notes. Uh, so you'll have these, uh, these things for your, your records. And uh, there's other things that you'll be learning yourself.